All right, welcome. Oh my goodness, it is Wednesday night. Am I really live here? Yes, I am. Oh my goodness. All right. So I'm waiting for my friends. I see my friend Dawn. Dawn, we need to talk. I have a conference tomorrow. It's here in Atlanta, but I do have a conference. Hi, Bunny. Missed you the other night. Hope you're feeling well. Okay. So we're going to be getting started here. Food Addiction Fair and Firm. Hello, hello, friends. Welcome. Friends are gathering. Hope you invited your friends. You know, I need to take more responsibility to do this, but one of the things that I would like to ask everybody is if you are involved in support groups online, whether they be for bariatric surgery or other recovery reasons, or if you are involved in weight loss support groups online, please invite your friends to join us. And I think that pretty much everybody can learn something here, whether or not they struggle with food addiction. However, this program is Food Addiction, Fair and Firm. I am Dr. Connie Stapleton, and I am a recovering alcoholic, coding addict, drug addict, anorexic, <laughs> um, workaholic. Lots of isms going on with me, and I work every day putting forth effort to live a life of recovery and healing from my addictive tendencies and to stay in remission from my disease of active addiction. So thank God, and I do mean thank God, I have had the gift of sobriety and recovery for the past 28 years. And this program is part of my way of giving back and to sharing with others the things that have helped me remain clean and sober for this long and to learn to heal the relationship with, my, with myself because at the root and the heart of all addiction is a certain level of shame. So we need to heal that shame if we are going to stay clean and sober. And of course, abstinence is the first step it's the first requirement in order to find a true program of recovery. Recovery is healing. It's healing the mind. It's healing the body. It's healing the spirit. It's learning to live fully, learning to appreciate yourself, learning to have compassion for yourself. We have compassion for a lot of other people. We need to work on having compassion for ourselves. All right. So I had some funny things happen today. Thought I ran out of gas on the interstate. Yeah. I have an issue with that. And I keep telling my husband if the car would just talk to me, then I might not run out of gas so often. Well, so often I say it's happened once in probably the last 20 years, but I almost ran out of gas today, but I didn't. But I did have some funny things happen today. Um, <laughs> I literally had a young woman say to me, you're, you're really very pretty considering your age out loud said, considering your age, at which point I just cracked up laughing hysterically because I thought it was too funny that she said that out loud, <laughs> but it was a very sweet, kind compliment. And then I was at the gas station and um, I was trying to get gas and my credit card wasn't working and a guy came up to me and he was like, ma'am, could you spare some change? You know, started talking about being an alcoholic, and whatever. I had to go to the bathroom so dang bad that I was just like, here, here's the money. So he was very, very grateful. Well, I could not get that dang thing gas pump to work. So I had to like, you know, I had to really go to the bathroom mad. So I was like dying and trying to get to the next gas station, thinking my car is out of gas. So I finally make it, get my gas in the car, run in, go to the bathroom. I'm like, wow, this other man is approaching me. And I'm like, what in the world? So I'm like trying to run into my car. And he's like, ma'am, ma'am, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to bother you. I just wanted to tell you that you rock short hair. So it was just the funniest damn day. Um, you know, rocking my short hair, looking good considering my age, right? <laughs> Oh, God, I'm going to take these compliments where I can get them. All right. Hope you are having a good day, too. Uh, let's see. Moving on, we are talking about recovery. Recovery from food addiction. Are you a food addict? 
Are you a food addict and an addict of other things as well? Do you use things to avoid yourself, to numb yourself from your feelings, to stay away from, you know, whatever's going on in life, on life's terms? Do you not want to deal with crazy in-laws or crazy family members or a stressful job or sick children or ailing parents? Well, nobody does. But guess what? In recovery, we deal with whatever life throws us with the help and support of other people. Tonight, we're going to talk about something that gets in the way for a lot of us, uh, gets in the way of our serenity. And remember, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the promises. And one of the promises of living fully in recovery is having a peace of mind. Having a peace of mind, you know, things don't... Uh, get us get our ideas in a wad like they used to we you know we're going to react we're going to have reactions but we learn to go wait a minute is it worth my serenity is it worth my peace of mind traffic jams are they really worth my peace of mind um if you're late to a meeting is it really going to be the end of the world you know is it worth your serenity what about somebody being mad at you or, you know, spreading rumors about you or they're lying on me. Oh, my God. You know, is it really that big of a deal? Are we going to get our undies all in a wad? Well, a lot of these things, for one thing, are exaggerated in our minds. They are built up to be bigger than they really are. And so sometimes we catastrophize. I used that word with somebody yesterday and they said, what does that word catastrophize mean? And it's making a mountain out of a molehill, making a bigger deal out of something than it really is. Again, that's not to say we're not going to have feelings about things. But if we make them bigger deals than they are, really, because maybe we want to make them a bigger deal than they are, really, because maybe we want an excuse to drink or eat or spend money or however we get even with nobody, right? Sometimes we create catastrophes for that purpose, right? Well, we're going to talk specifically about resentments today because resentments are one of the biggest, mm, what do I want to call them? One of the biggest excuses. Sometimes people use resentments as excuses to overeat or to say, oh, why bother? Or to drink or to shop or, you know, get online to ignore family, to fight with people. Um, so sometimes we can manipulate or exaggerate these resentments. Now, there are times when people do us wrong. I mean, you know, if you ask 100 people and you say, okay, this happened, you know, am I, am, am I out of line by feeling upset or frustrated or angry or resentful? Well, you might not be out of line. Maybe they did something that was egregiously hurtful to you. Is it still worth your serenity? You know what I do at those times? I had a situation, this situation occur a couple of years ago. And I'm telling you, it threatens my serenity regularly. <laughs> because whenever I think about this certain thing that happened in association with this certain person with whom it happened, I get really ticked. And as much as I know better, right, there are times when I give in to my anger and my resentment. So I'll call one of those three friends that I tell you about a lot, and I will, you know, I'll rant and I'll rave and I'll, you know, and one of my friends will say to me, I hear your self-righteous indignation. And I'm like, that word always kind of takes me back like I'm being self-righteous and I'm being indignant well you know what I am for that moment so I count on these three friends to allow me my few moments of self-righteous indignation in other words my venting my spewing my safe place where I can go do you know what this person did do you know what they did this time and do you know what they did that time and I they, 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 right? Really not appropriate adult behavior. However, having a safe place, a few safe people where I can say, can I just 
give this to you with the intensity at which I feel it, and I will process it after that and be the grown-up and talk about how I'm being irrational about it. But it helps me if I have somebody where I can just like, Bleh! you know, and they know I'm not going to go drink over it. I'm not going to take any pills over it. I'm not going to smoke a cigarette. I'm not going to lash out, but I'm going to get it out. The getting it out is healthy, right? Um, I think I told you one time about one of these friends named Sally and her little boy. Well, he's not so little anymore. That little shit grew up on me. His little shit is my um, nickname, my loving nickname for him. He won't even let his mama call him little shit. Only Aunt Connie gets to call him little shit. Well, little shit and I had a little place where he could vent. And when he was young, like eight, nine, or ten, I've told you this before, we would go on the trampoline. And the trampoline was the place where he could use foul language. He could say cuss words and he wouldn't get in trouble. But that was his safe place to vent. Much healthier to get it out in a safe place, have all your righteous indignation with a safe person, and then process it, right? Is it really that bad? Am I making a bigger deal out of it than it is? Um, is it hurtful? Yes, maybe it's hurtful. But is it really worth my serenity for more than this few moments when I'm being righteously indignant? But it's important that you talk it out and you process it out. Because anger is energy. It's energy and energy needs to come out. Well, this past weekend, Graham, who's five, uh, and my oldest grandson, you know, he he uh, had a, a friend over after school, and they were playing baseball. They were hitting hitting the baseball, and he Graham got mad because he didn't get to hit the ball twice or whatever he was mad about. So he stomped off, and he he went over to the neighbors, and they have like these these stepping stone kinds of things on the ground in the grass. These stones, and he sat down on the ground, and I said, I said you know what, Graham, that's a really great idea. Sit on that stone and get it all out. Kick your feet, stomp your feet, do what you got to do. That's a really good idea. We should all have a stone. So he sat over there. And so the next day we were doing something. And of course he's, he's getting upset about whatever it was. And he looked at me and he just had that face and he started walking away. I said, are you going to your stone? And he said, yes. And I said, that's a great idea. You use that stone, buddy, whenever you need it. When you're all done, you come on back. I wasn't setting that up the day before, you know. It just kind of happened. And so he is learning that when he needs a, a cool-off place without being sent to time out by an adult, he's got a place he can go. He's allowed to get it all out. He can stomp his feet. He can... You know, he's not bothering anybody. We just kind of leave him up. And I kind of give him the thumbs up every once in a while, like encouraging him. So find yourself a spot. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I was just thinking about this. It's a stepping stone, right? It's a stepping stone to healthier behavior. It's a stepping stone to letting go of resentment. Find yourself a stepping stone. Just made that up, right? But find yourself a stepping stone where you can safely vent, safely get your anger out, and not carry around a resentment because a resentment is a persistent feeling of ill will, right? That's kind of a definition of it, a persistent feeling of ill will. And this person toward whom I feel some hostility if I let myself get caught up in my frustration with them, you know, if I gave myself permission or allowed myself to think about this person or when I do think about them and something gets stirred up or something triggers a memory or triggers, you know, a, a reminder of the situation that happened, I can get going. Now, I have a choice there, right? I can go down the spiral with stinking thinking and get, you know, angry all over again. And I can have that persistent feeling of ill will or bitterness. But that is not how I want to live my life. So I've had to utilize some skills that I'm going to share with you um, in a little bit to 
if I find myself going down that negative spiral, which is only going to lead to a whole bunch of sh icky stuff, right? Because if I'm going down with stinking thinking, thinking influences our feelings. So if I start thinking, oh, I can't believe they did this. and I still get mad when I think about that. And, and I relive the whole thing again in my mind. So I am creating with my stinking thinking unpleasant feelings, frustration, anger, resentment, um, bitterness. So if I'm allowing this to continue and I'm feeling cruddy and I'm feeling angry, then I'm not going to be pleasant to be around, right? That is not a meaningful matter to me. A meaningful matter is to be kind and, you know, to spread a smile or a cheerful word or, you know, encounter people with as much pleasantness as I possibly can. That's important to me. So if I give myself permission or if I allow myself to put on that stinking thinking spiral, you know what? I might just get so ticked off that I'm like, well, forget about it. I'm just going to go have a hot fudge Sunday, Right? So sometimes, sometimes we go looking for trouble because we want an excuse. We want an excuse. We want somebody else to blame for something that we do, that we know we don't need to be doing. All right. So let's talk again about this definition of resentment. This kind of ongoing feeling of ill will or bitterness, right? It's kind of consuming. It kind of takes over. It's very negative. And if you get consumed by a negative thought, that's probably no longer even based in reality, right? Is this going to do anything good for me? Is it doing anything good for you? I want you all to think about two or three resentments that you've held on to for a long time, right? I mean, I can think of my immediate family that I grew up with, <laughs> and I could resurrect some resentments that I held on to and used to my benefit, although it wasn't really to my benefit, it was to my detriment. But at the time, I thought I was getting leverage out of it, right? I was getting mileage out of it. Sometimes when we're doing something that doesn't, um, doesn't lead toward our meaningful matters, but leads against it. One of the things to ask ourselves is what am I getting out of this? Like a lot of times when I was in treatment or a lot of times when I'm the therapist, I'll say to people, what are you getting out of that? You know, what are you getting up by hanging on to that resentment? What are you getting by, um, you know, continuing to badmouth this person? Or what are you getting by, you know, um, constantly thinking that people are out to get you? Or what are you getting by um, assuming that people are blaming you, right? Well, you know, in fact, this happened today when I was working with somebody. You know, we've, I've talked before about how, how we develop themes by things that based on, are, are based on things that actually happened to us, but then we recreate them in our adult lives. And this person has a theme of, I'm always to blame. People are always blaming me, like I'm, I'm the victim, right? And so we will twist and turn situations in our mind so that we can come to that conclusion. So why do we need that conclusion? Well, maybe I need to be the victim because if I'm a victim, then maybe somebody will feel sorry for me. And maybe feeling sorry for me is the only way I know to ask for help. You know, it gets convoluted, but we got to dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. But one of the really big questions to ask yourself when you're doing anything that is leading you against your own values or away from meaningful matters is, what am I getting out of this? So if you're hanging on to a resentment, you need to ask yourself, why am I choosing to disrupt my serenity? Why am I choosing to linger, to magnify these negative emotions, right? So it could be something real that happened or something you imagine, right? But we dwell on those things and, and those 
emotions get out of proportion with this thing that happened. Because if we keep that thing alive and we make it bigger, it's like, you know, the fishtail caught a fish this big and we tell people it was this big and then it was that big. And over a couple of years now, we'd caught, you know, we, we won the state record for the biggest fish. Now, that's not an example of a resentment, but we can do that with a resentment, right? It's like you think somebody, um, oh, gave you the cold shoulder. Well, maybe that somebody had a crisis on their mind. They didn't even see you, but you're like, oh, they just completely overlooked me. They didn't even, they didn't even acknowledge my presence. So now you, you, you're like armed and ready every time you see that person. And every time you see that person, it's like, are they going to ignore me today? Oh, see? And then we're probably going to get what we're looking for, even though we may be completely imagining it, right? But we dwell on those things and it gives us some kind of power or ammunition or sickness is what it is, right? Because a lot of these things are really misinterpreted. We ascribe, we make things really personal. Like, um, let's say you're, here's one I hear a lot. People think people are watching what they eat at the restaurant, you know, because maybe you're self-conscious about your size or, you know, uh, your weight or something. And you're assuming, you're, you're imagining, maybe, maybe there are times it's happened. I'm not saying it hasn't or it doesn't, but maybe you're assuming people are looking at you or watching what you're eating or, you know, maybe they don't even care. Maybe somebody was, you know how sometimes you just are like staring and you're not really looking at anything. So maybe somebody was just looking your way and they were off in la-la land thinking about something that had nothing to do with you. But in your mind, you're interpreting it this way. Why do you need that? Right? What is that about for you? What's my part? Okay. So you apply those questions where you, you, you know, you go like, is that real? Is that true? And then you ask those best friends of yours in your life and you say, you know, I was thinking at the restaurant when we were there earlier that these people were watching me. Do you think it was true? If they all go, yep, by God, I, I noticed it. That person really was staring at you. <laughs> well, maybe they were, but they might be going, what are you talking about? I didn't see that at all. Or if you're somewhere and somebody says something to you and you're like, did you hear how how critically they said that to me? Check it out with your friends. I didn't hear it that way. You know, maybe they were just, but remember, we all have a lens, a filter through which we see things and hear things and we don't always see them accurately or hear them accurately. We interpret them based on our past experiences. So, all right. Now, let's talk about, you know, some common reasons for resentments, right? Sometimes we get angry because you're not the boss of me. Don't think you can tell me what to do, right? Even though that's a very childish sentiment. <laughs> a lot of times we're like, we resent people telling us what to do. Um, sometimes, oh, here's a good one. This is one I encounter so often in the work that I do. People fail to respond in the way you want them to. Had a person say to me today, it's not worth saying anything to that person because they'll just dismiss what I have to say anyway. They might. They might not. How do you know? Because that's what they've always done. Well, maybe they have always done that. But are you saying it to them for yourself or because you expect a specific response? We don't have the right to expect a specific response from people, right? It's just like with weight. We're responsible for the effort we put into what we do. But we can't control the outcome. And I use this example in my class a lot. If we have 10 people... And all 10 people for a month eat the exact same things, the exact same amounts, at the exact same time, do the exact same exercise at the exact same time. Those 10 people are going to have different results in terms of weight lost, inches lost, et cetera, et cetera, because our bodies are different. So you are only responsible. This is one of those things that I tell you, keep in mind at all times, you're only responsible for the effort you put into whatever you do, not the outcome. So if you are putting forth the effort into 
you know, you got to do them and you stick to it, your body's going to respond over time. If you, maybe not like you want in the time frame you want, but it will. So if you are upset with somebody and you choose not to say something to them because you know exactly how they'll respond, well, you might have a pretty good idea. But might you just be looking for a reason to stay ticked off at that person, right? Because you're not putting forth the effort to do your part. I'm upset with you because I heard this. This was the example today. This person was upset with somebody because they heard through the grapevine that this person had done something with someone else and had refused to do it with them. So they were all ticked off and, and righteously indignant because how could they? And, you know, they couldn't do it for me, but they did it for that person. And I'm like, you don't even know if it's true. Oh, yeah, it's true. I checked it out with some other people. That's what you call hearsay, right? So what, you know, what's the benefit to you of carrying around your assumption? You know, you know, maybe you just want to be ticked off. Maybe you just want to be the victim. Maybe you just want to say, I knew they were, you know, I knew, I knew it. Well, is that going to do you any good in terms of recovery? which is keeping a clean emotional slate, right? No. So maybe to say to that person, I don't know if this is even true, but I heard that you had done such and such with so-and-so. And if it's true, it hurts my feelings because I had asked you to do this and you said no. You have a right to do whatever you want, whomever you want. I just wanted you to let me let you know that it hurt my feelings if it's true right? You're not accusing. You're not. You're clearing your own slate. But if you're doing that expecting to hear, well, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Well, you're barking up the wrong tree because we don't have the right to expect. I mean, it would be nice. Heck yeah. Especially if somebody does something that 99% of the people would say, yeah, that was pretty darn rude, right? It would be nice to go to them and say it was really hurtful to me. When you, da, 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 it would be really nice to hear, yeah, I'm really sorry. But if you're going with the expectation that that happens and it doesn't, and then you choose to carry around this bitterness with you, that's on you, right? That's on you. You can choose to carry the bitterness. You can choose not to, mm. right? Even if it makes sense that you were hurt, feelings are fine. Feelings are fine. So you express the feelings, you deal with the feelings in an appropriate, healthy way. But if you choose to carry on, carry them on um, and hold on to them and have an excuse to be ticked off at the world, that's on you, right? So one of the ways that you can deal with resentments, because I think we've all been genuinely hurt or upset or frustrated or I think we're all holding on to some resentments, right? But one of the things we say is we're handing people over our power when we give, we're giving them too much power over our serenity, over our feelings, over our, um, our serenity, over our recovery. Because anger and bitterness and replaying negative incident, incidents, regardless of how valid we think they are, isn't going to help us. The other person doesn't even know, right? What, you know, there's a lot of great sayings about when you're angry at somebody, it's like, I don't know, what do they say? I don't know, but you're giving them the power. They don't even know. They don't even know you're putting all this energy into them. Yeah, you guys write out what those real true sayings are because I can't remember them. But, okay, so part of what you want to do is choose not to let your... Choose not to hold on to those things that are going to um, mess with your serenity, right? The present is now, and don't you want to enjoy the present? So you may find yourself thinking about a situation that upset you or, you know, and you might need to really process it through with a therapist or a good friend or, I mean, we do have to work through things. I'm not saying that, but it's if we hang on to the anger and the bitterness, 
that we're harming ourselves, right? Maybe leading to um, relapse in, in your recovery. We don't want that, all right? So some ideas are to find like a stepping stone or sit in your car and scream or, you know, find a safe place where you can kick your, kick your feet and stomp and cuss if you need to, jump on the trampoline, you know, whatever it is, find a safe place to get it out. Got to get it out, right? Definitely got to get it out. You can journal. You can write about it. You can burn the letter. You can, you know, and you may have to do it five or 10 or 15 times. I sometimes think that the people that we have the most anger and bitterness and resentment toward are people we care about the most. You know, it's that equal and opposite thing. The people we love the most are the people we stay angry with the most. So sometimes if, sometimes I tell people every day for a week, I want you to write a letter that you're not going to send them every day. Don't hold back. Don't, you know, just whatever language you want. They're never going to see it. You're never going to hurt them. Just get it out. What oftentimes happens is you'll start out really angry and nasty and mean. And every day it lightens up and it simmers down. And by the end, you're like, I really love you. And it makes me so sad. And it, I hate that this is happening with us. And right. So your anger gives way to some underlying emotions, which might be sadness or, you know, hurt, fear, you know, so work through the feelings. Don't give it more time than things deserve, right? Um, work hard to feed your positive emotions, right? If you're thinking angrily about somebody, try to think about, it's called remembered wellness is what this is called, remembered wellness. Remember a time that things were really good between the two of you. You know, remember the times when you enjoyed their company the most or things you did that were really funny or silly or playful. Now that might evoke some sadness because you don't have that going on right now or you might not ever have that again. But at least it's genuine and at least you can remember that you don't really hate this person or, you know, these feelings, these intense feelings of animosity are really because you are hurt and you care so much about that person and you really miss them maybe. Um, journaling is always a great thing. Talking to somebody else is always a great thing. Um, sometimes you're gonna wanna confront the person directly with just, when this happened, I felt this way because what I'm hoping is, you may not get what you're hoping for but just to talk to the person, you know? And it's not, you did this, and when you did that, and you made me feel it, that is absolutely, there's nothing appropriate about that, right? Here's an amazing, appropriate communication sentence. When blank, when you walked away from me at the party and left me there by myself, I felt angry, and hurt and sad because I felt because um, I, I didn't know if you were going to come back. I didn't know how I was going to get home. I was embarrassed. I was in front of all of our friends. You're just talking about how you felt, not what they made you feel. Okay. When you left, I felt this way because. I'm hoping we can talk through this and figure out a way to prevent that from happening again. Or um, when, uh, um, let me think, when, um, okay, when you talk, when you were talking to so and so uh, at dinner the other night, I felt hurt. Because it seemed to me like you were ignoring me. It seemed to me like you were, you don't want to say you were ignoring me and I don't know why you were ignoring me and they're more important to you and I don't, you don't care about me, right? When you turned and talked to the person on the other side of you, I felt ignored because I didn't know anyone else and you seemed to spend a lot of time talking to them. 
I'm wondering if there's a way that I could let you know um, that I would appreciate a little bit of attention in the moment without creating the scene. Or I'm wondering if there's a signal that I could give you that, oh God, I need, I need some help. I'm feeling really out of, out of place or, you know, so dealing with it in an appropriate, healthy way. Now they may say, sorry, you know, put on your big girl panties and deal with strangers. I don't know, but they might say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. What happened was they, you know, they asked me a, a question about, I don't know, but before you accuse and hold a resentment, find out what was going on, right? So focus on the positive journal, find a place that you can, um, that you can get it out in a safe, healthy way. And always, 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 a person who's living a healthy program of recovery and healing from addiction will say, what's my part? What role, if any, did I play in that situation, right? What is my part? Because if you look, most of the time, we're going to have a part. We don't want to look at our part, right? Because the purpose of denial is to protect ourselves from our own feelings. Well, in a healthy recovery program, we deal with our feelings. I'm really embarrassed that I contributed to this or I'm really sad that I made this all about you when I can see that I really started this when I um, you know when I made a sarcastic comment you know whatever it is own your part it's tough to do right it's a lot easier to blame hold a resentment but resentments believe me in terms of addiction and recovery are one of the most dangerous things there are, right? Because a lot of times we eat emotionally or we drink out of emotion or we spend money because we're ticked off and, you know, we justify it because we're mad and we blame other people. So get rid of resentment. When it comes to your mind, maybe set a timer. You know what? I'm going to give myself 30 seconds to think about this situation and then time's up i'm moving on because i'm not gonna allow it to steal my serenity i'm not gonna allow it to take my peace to you know ruin this day that's got great potential in it and if you find that you've ruined half the day you know what you don't have to wait till next monday <laughs> to start having a good day again to to eat better to you know, put away the pity party uh, fixings. Start over right now. Start over right now. So resentments are dangerous in our recovery. So talk to somebody. You know what? Maybe go home and, uh, or maybe sit down after this and write down a list of the resentments you have and two or three specific ways that you plan to work through these resentments so that they don't clog your emotional being right because clogged emotional self equals finding reasons to to use it's not what we're about we're about living fully this day and every day um, because guess what your health is your responsibility my health is my responsibility we all have a responsibility but we can't do it alone let's do this together let's face life on life's terms and get the help we need from each other means learning to ask for help that's what we got to do right because there are people you know what people like to help people we like to help people it does us good it does them good so let's pass on the helping of each other all right and let's celebrate our recoveries together you know what an amazing gift my life could never ever 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 i i could never have known the joy of friendships, of relationships, and really the whole world, our life is about connecting in positive ways. So you choose, connect in positive or negative ways with people in your heart. And you know what they say, pray for people you're angry with, pray for people that you resent. 
It's true. It works. It helps. It helps you. It helps them. Okay. So there are a lot of good things going on. Um, life is good. There are a lot of bad things going on in the world, but life is good and people are mostly good. And I believe, believe 100% in my soul that there are so many good acts of kindness in a day that far, far outweigh the atrocities that we hear about, right? There's a lot of smiles given. There are a lot of hugs given. There are a lot of I love yous stated. So be part of that goodness. It does you good, does your recovery good, and it most certainly does someone else good. So I will see you next time. This is Food Addiction Fair and Firm. And I appreciate you, my friends, being here and spending this time with me. So let's go out and make the rest of the night good and tomorrow great. Thanks for spending your time. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.